No, our first guest is an actor turned director, turned travel writer, turned New York Times bestselling author. His latest book details the 500 mile journey he and his son made across Spain. We welcome to Afternoon Live the author of Walking with Sam. Andrew McCarthy is with us here. This is such a pleasure to have you here with us. It's great Thanks to for be with you. Us. In town to promote this new book of yours. You are such a beautiful writer. I mean, I love oh. this book and the conversations you have with your son with it. Really well done. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's uh, it's nice to be back here in Portland. I love Portland, so it's great to be back. Uh, yeah, no, it was a real <coughs> sort of labor of love, us walking across the country together, across Spain on the old Camino de Santiago, which was, yeah, I'd done the trek about 25 years earlier, and it was a real life changer for me. And as my son was sort of cusping manhood, I thought it might be a good thing for him to help him find himself a little bit, and it, it proved to be an amazing journey. Yeah, you talk about how each time it came at like the right time in your life. So even 25 years ago when you did it, that first time, how did you kind of turn into a different person from it? Well, I think I was at that point in my life, I had survived this sort of early blush with success and fame with all the Brad Pack stuff, and I think I was a bit lost, and I didn't really even realize it at the time, and so I stumbled upon the Camino, and it really changed my life. It helped me, I suppose I suffered from what we now call imposter syndrome a little bit, you know? Uh, we didn't have a name for it back then. And, uh, <laughs> and it really helped me land in myself. And it really, you know, I just felt much more at home in myself in the world after that. And then I thought as my son was starting, you know, it would help him too. But it's 500 miles. Yeah, like it's it a sounds track. Like, it's, I mean, it's a walk. It's, it's beautiful. <laughs> so you think, oh, okay, that's nice. It's 500 miles, beautiful through Spain. I want to do that. That sounds lovely. But it is gruesome. Well, it's not all beautiful, too, because you're walking in and out of cities, and walking in and out of cities is not pretty. Uh, but that's all just part of it. You know, you start the morning in a village of 12 people, and you walk into a city of 250,000, you know, and that's kind of an interesting experience we don't do in most daily life. So it really helped us get to know each other in a certain way and, and really helped me to see my son. You know, I think that's all any of us ever really want is, like, see me, see who I am. You know, our kids, we th they look like us, they kind of sound like us. We think we know them, and we don't necessarily know them. So just to get to sort of see who he was and let him see me, that was a big deal. But what was his first response? He's a 19 year old well, and he's like, his dad <laughs> wants to spend a lot of time with him. Well, luckily he didn't think about that part. But on, <laughs> on day two, he did say to me, dad, what's the point of this effing walk? And, you know, he didn't say effing, right? And then on the last day, he did say, dad, that's the only 10 out of 10 thing I've ever done in my life. So, mm -hmm you know, it happened for him, which I knew it would. I knew if I could just keep him walking, the event would happen, you know. And I, and I learned to largely keep my mouth shut, you know. In parenting, we're so busy telling our kids and telling them and advising them and counseling them. And I just kind of learned just let him process. I had the ultimate luxury you get with an adult child, which is time, you know, so I could just be with him and not have to solve everything, which was truly a big deal. You were really real in this, telling even about his TikTok stories to exes. I mean, has he read this yet to kind of see these conversations that you put in here? Well, no, my son's not a big reader, so he's <laughs> waiting for the audiobook. <laughs> he has not read it. I gave it to him. I said, you know, Sam, I'm turning this in. You ought to take a look at it. And he read about 10 pages, and he said, that seems like the trip. I'm like, okay. <laughs> but we did do the audiobook together, so he read all his dialogue, and he was okay with most of it. Although occasionally he'd say, I, I didn't say that. I go, well, you did now. Read it. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, I mean, how you remember all this, I'm curious. As a travel writer, you have experience doing this, but you write out everything just as like you're living it in such a wonderful way, these conversations that you have with them, meeting people along the way. Are you making notes as you travel? How are you able to actually to capture it as well as you did? Yeah, I mean, I am a travel writer in my other life, so... I know that I'm not going anywhere without eventually writing about it in some form. So I had little notebooks and I would just take, jot down little tiny notes as we were walking, just sort of <coughs> keep walking. And then um, I knew I had a book, when that really occurred to me when you walk the 500 miles to Santiago de Compostela and then that's where the pilgrimage ends. But it's 50 miles from the sea and a lot of walkers continue on to the end to the ocean to a place called Finisterre and I did not need to do that. I was, got to Santiago and was ready to sit down. But my son said, I'm going to walk on to the sea. And the low-hanging fruit of that metaphor was too much for me to resist, you know, and the idea of our children going beyond our accomplishments. Mm -hmm. And so w once he was going to go beyond what I did, I thought, oh, I have a book there. You absolutely do. And I love how you kind of married 
I feel like I can take this along now and do this with my kids someday because it almost tells me how to do it and where I'm going to land day by day, mile by mile, but also the relationship that you have with him throughout. I mean, he was sick of you after what, day one? <laughs> well, I'd like to think he got less sick of me as exactly. we went along. Exactly. He started off like already <laughs> announcing it, like I'm sick of you day one. And so yeah. it's like, oh boy. And then you have 500, 480, whatever miles to go. Yeah. No. So we had that inverse thing. I think it did bring us um, much closer in that way. Oh, for sure. I mean, so for him seeing this and he was going through it and you you remember, I remember there's a point in it, it was at the Plaza Del Santo, whatever it is, where you remember that exact moment of being there on your own, almost his age, I mean, a little bit older than him. What was that like to kind of see these same places in such a different light with your own son? Well, it's really interesting how fallible my memory is. I thought I'd remembered everything. And you know, there was so much of it that seemed brand new to me. And we, I, I, I realized how much we sort of concoct our narrative of our life out of, you know, fragments and piecemeal things. So it was really a discovery, uh, a rediscovery totally of, of the Camino. I saw it all anew again, which was kind of wonderful, you know. I like what you share about travel, that it, you know, kind of mitigates fear in a way for people. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, on the first trip, I had a, I had a real cathartic moment in a field of wheat where I broke down into sobs, and it occurred to me in that instant how much fear had dominated my life. You know, it seemed odd because I was in movies, I was having this successful outward life, but it really dawned on me how much fear had, had influenced all my decisions. And that, in the moment of that discovery, it was very liberating, and that's what, that changed my life. And, it was sort of before the field of wheat in my life and after. Mm -hmm. And that's what, in that first journey, changed it and why I always want to go back again. Now, there's so many moments in this with your son, but can you share one of your greatest memories from this trip? Well, I think at the end, you know, when he was, went off to Finisterre and I was sitting down for a few days and then I took a taxi <laughs> out to meet him at the end. It's amazing how in an hour car ride you cover what's walked in three days. But uh, anyway, just waiting to receive him as he came charging up the hill with his arms pumping his shirt off, his sunburn, and just being there to receive him and him allowing me to receive him, you know, in a way that was kind of, uh, uh, that was a very moving thing for me as a dad to just sort of see my son, you know, stepping into his own manhood in a certain way, both literally and um, figuratively. But now you're back to, I mean, I hate to call it real life because everything's yeah. real life. What was that like the following week that you're here back in the States? Was it, it seemed like time was like, had so much time had passed because you're in a whole different world back then? It's funny, traveling those kind of trips, they're always, you can, you can describe them, you can tell people, but you can't, it's just something very private in a certain way, you know? Mm -hmm. And even from, from Sam, I walked a very different Camino than he did. We're walking side by side the whole way, but our internal life is all so different and unique. But yeah, when you get back, you kind of want to instantly go back to Spain and start over again. Right, because how did your relationship change overall? Oh, I think, frankly, we just, he said that, you know, I just trust you more down, Dad, so mm. I'll take that. Because did you, know? you share more with him about your life during that journey? I did. I, you know, when we talk, you know, everything was on the table. I mean, he, day one, he was asking me about the divorce from his mom, who I got divorced from his mom when he was two. But, like, he talked about that. And then he said, I go, okay, so it's all going to be on the table here. And then uh, we, talked, we talked about my career. He was going, you know, Dad, you're not, you don't just have to be what you were when you were young. You know, it's not too late for you. You can still do stuff. I'm like, oh my God, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, we just talk sort of about everything and nothing, the way you do when you're walking. You know, walking is such a wonderful way to process things emotionally, mentally, and, you know, you talk about important things and then suddenly you drift into trivial things and then you have long silences and then you're talking again. And so it all just kind of flows together in a way that we just don't in our daily life. Yeah, it's, it's so well done, and there's so much more to share. Thank you so much. You know, we want to let you know that Andrew has a book event tonight at Powell City of Books in downtown Portland. The event starts at 7 p.m. It's right there at 10.05 at West Burnside. We'll have more information on our website at katu.com. But he's sticking around. We have so much more to talk about. There's his book right there, Walking with Sam. We'll continue the conversation when we come back. Don't go away. Welcome back to Afternoon Live.
We are back with actor, director, and author Andrew McCarthy with us about his book Walking with Sam. Such we've been talking about this book. It is so good. Sam, by the way, is followed in your footsteps. I know in the book you mentioned to him, you know, he's kind of struggling, like, what am I gonna do with my life? Like, am I gonna go on to college? And you're kind of not wanting to push him in anything, but you do mention you hope that he does not follow your career, and look, he has. <laughs> the last thing I wanted for any of my kids was them to be actors. But you know, in a very real way, acting saved my life when I was 15. You know, I walked out on stage in a high school play and that was it. I knew in that instant what I wanted to do with my life and what I would do. I just, and so then I kind of realized who am I to say? I mean, if it saved my life, it could save theirs. And yeah, my son is on a show called Dead to Me on Netflix. Mm -hmm. It's uh, terrific. So yeah, he's, he's an actor now. So, the, and he's terrific. He's very good. He's very good. I was like, I could just picture him because of Dead to Me as playing a son in that show, you know, of him, his answers to you in this book. I was like visioning that the whole time. But you know, he, so you start off when you're 15, a little bit younger than him. Well, you're cut from a basketball team, and that's what led you to. Yeah, I was cut from the high school basketball team. Crushed, and my, I'm sure. I was. I was yeah. heartbroken. And my mom was like, dear, why don't you try out for the school play? And I'm like, oh, I don't want to be in the play. I want to be the point guard. Anyway, I, <laughs> I did, and I was cast as the Artful Dodger in Oliver, and I was brilliant. <laughs> and I was in a certain way because I was so, that moment happened to me. I walked out on stage, and literally I was, you know, the, American player Tennessee Williams has a great line talking about love. He said, it's as if a room that had always been half in shadow was suddenly in the light. And that's what I felt like the minute I walked on stage. I went, oh my God, there I am. But how do you go there from that and getting your first movie role? That's all just wild, blind luck. <laughs> I was in college. I'd been kicked out of college after two years. Uh, I wasn't a very good student. And a friend called me up and said, they're casting, there's an ad in the newspaper, they're casting a movie, they're looking for someone 18, vulnerable, and sensitive to be the lead in the movie. And I was like, oh my, <laughs> come on, <laughs> that's me. So I went to this open call, meaning anyone could go, and I sat there with 500 other 18, vulnerable, and sensitive kids, and then went in and auditioned, uh, met a guy, and just, and I, 10 auditions later, I was in the movies. And that's pretty impressive. And then from there, such a career. I mean, with labeled as the Brat Pack, but um, you, for the, so your first movie, Class, what yeah. year was that? 1982. 1982, okay. But then comes along all these others, so Pretty in Pink. I mean, when people see you and they recognize you, before they even say what they recognize you from, do you know just from your movies and just the wide range what they're going to say? Well, I hate to profile people, but there are certain <laughs> people that come up and I go, oh, no, here comes a lesson zero guy. You know, and then, oh, there's a Pretty in Pink. Uh, yeah, so... But, I mean, those movies are kind of amazing how they've endured and lived on and... I and other members of the Brat Pack have sort of become, in a very real way, the avatars of youth for a certain generation of people. Mm -hmm. You know, those movies happened, and the generation that saw them, you know, at 17, 18, 19, you're just starting your life, you're just cusping into the world, and your life is a blank slate to be written on, and it's a really powerful, potent time. And looking back on that is such a warm memory for so many people and I represent that to them. So they look at me and they start talking and their eyes kind of glaze over and I realize they're not even talking to me anymore. They're talking to themselves and recalling their own youth. You know, and to be the representative of that, I've come to realize is a beautiful thing. You know, I didn't always feel that way. But uh, um, I wrote a book a couple years ago about my time in the Brat Pack and that helped me really process and realize, you know, what a great gift it is to sort of represent that to Yeah, people. There, there it is, Brat. You're going to be doing a documentary on this. What is it? You had not been in contact with Emilio, with Rob Lowe in 30 years? Yeah, I mean, when I finished that book, I realized I kind of went, wow, I know what I feel about that now. And it was such a seminal event in my life. It changed the course of who I would become and how I would be perceived in the world and perceived myself. And it was, a, you know, a massive deal. And I realized I hadn't talked to any of the other gang about that. And so I just called them all up and I said, can I come talk to you? I want to make a documentary about what it, you know, it was a seismic event in my life. What was it in yours? And so I went and saw, you know, went, I would just drive up to their houses and went and saw them. And yeah, it's been an amazing experience to rekindle that, to see how much affection we all have for each other and for our own youth in a way we didn't when we were young because we were young and scared and competitive. And now, you know, we're old and none of that matters. That's <laughs> so. not true. But I'm wondering, was there one in particular even that you ended up seeing and sharing your stories and sharing your feelings and realizing you were much the same? Well, I think all our stories were very much the same, and that the Brad Pack is now is this warm and fuzzy, iconically affectionate term, but initially it was, it was a very negative thing. It was cast in aspersion. You know, it was an article from New York Magazine, and it was one article, and 
within days, the country was using the term brat pack. And it was really a negative term. You know, who wants to be called a brat? Who wants to be in a pack? Who wants to be, you know, and when you're young and just wanting to be seen for yourself, to be sort of pigeonholed like that, it was a lot for us and we didn't like it. And it altered our careers too. We, we, I thought, you know, like Martin Scorsese is not going to call up somebody who's in the brat pack to be in a movie, you know? And it was true, he's never called. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, are you there? So, but, but over time, like I say, it's gone 180 degrees to be like this amazing thing. I'm more than the sum of my parts because I'm a member of this iconically affectionate thing called the brat pack now, which is, you know, like I said, is an amazing kind of thing to be, you know, taff. Well, and a part of iconic movies that people don't just see once, they see over and over again. So Pretty in Pink, is that something that you've seen more than 10 times? I mean, you, what's well, one do you watch? I, I don't watch any of them, but I mean, people do. <laughs> but what's How it? do you not watch this? You're fantastic. Oh, my gosh, no. My daughter, uh, some of her friends told her she should watch this movie. She's 16, and so she watched the trailer for it, and she said, I, I, I'm not going to watch some movie where you're kissing some other woman. I don't want to see this. So... Uh, but no, I, I don't watch them at all. <laughs> Although I did, I have to say, I was in a hotel about a month ago, and I flipped on the TV, and I went into the bathroom, and then I heard them. I went, what, what is that? I came out, and it was me. And it was in Weekend <laughs> at Bernie's. And the last, like, oh, wow. and so I sat there watching the last 20 minutes of Weekend at Bernie's again, which I hadn't seen in you know, decades. Yeah. And I, I, was, I thought I was fantastic. <laughs> you were fantastic. <laughs> it was so funny and stupid and... Uh, and silly. I, I loved it, actually. It was really enjoyable to sit and watch myself, which I thought was also really weird to just sit there alone in a hotel room and yeah. watch myself on TV. But when you watch, like, what are you remembering from behind the scenes of those films? Well, that on Bernie, we loved doing that movie. We thought, you know, one of the adages in movies is that it's, if you're laughing, they're not going to laugh. You know, but we thought we were so funny. Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> the story was so ridiculous and just so, and anything went. You know, we would shoot the script and then Ted Koch, if the director, would just kind of say, do anything you want now. Go do anything. And it's like, well, what if we like staple a wig on his hair? And what if we just throw him over the balcony? And, you know, all this kind of crazy stuff. So, I mean, it was just really fun. Yeah, I mean, and again, like the mannequin. Mannequin was like one of those ones that I never went shopping the same again. Like you just like <laughs> thought differently of mannequins. But well, what mannequin's a one. funny because it's that's a movie that could never be made today. Of course, it's about a, a woman who comes to life only for a man. So it's like right. hello. And wasn't it supposed to be a young man either? Wasn't it supposed to be an older man? I don't even remember that part. Okay, I don't know. That's all, what I heard. Was it? Well, I'm glad it was me. I mean, <laughs> that movie though is so innocent and sweet and has not a cynical bone in its body. You know, so it, I have great affection for that movie. I think it's sort of very gentle and open-hearted. Do you think, I feel like movies from then are truly classics that people will always go back to. We were trying to share in our office, like what movies in the last 10 years would ever live on like some of those films? Do you feel that way about being part of them? Well, I mean, we always look back at the past with more affection than the present. But, you know, those movies did take young people seriously. J John Hughes, that's what he had to offer. You know, when you're 17, 18, it's... Th all those feelings are the most profound they ever be are in your life, you know? When you're in love at 17, it, you're the first person to have ever been in love. You know what I mean? I mean? Your heartbreak is the biggest heartbreak that's ever been, you know? And John Hughes knew that and honored that. And so he had great respect for young people in a way as not just dismissing them. Oh, you're young, you'll get over it. No, this is really important. This matters. And so now that generation is showing their kids these movies and the kids are like going yeah the hairdos are funny but the feelings are exactly the way I feel so they're sort of continuing on in this legacy that's kind of shocking to me. Yeah, speaking of John Hughes it was Molly Ringwald wasn't it who said to him he needs to be the guy in Pretty in Pink. Yeah I auditioned for Pretty in Pink and uh, the part was written for like this square jawed uh, football quarterback you know a hunk yeah. and uh, I went into and I was not that and I walked in to read, and I read, and I, they said, thank you. And I walked out like, okay. And Molly turned to John Hughes right after I walked out and said, that's the guy. And John Hughes said, that wimp? Oh. <laughs> and so, so they, yeah, he's really dreamy. He's poetic, you know. And uh, so, yeah, it was Molly that got me that part. And consequently, my sort of entire career, I suppose, I owe to Molly. Yeah. Well, we are out of time, but we have one other thing that we want to show you today. Are you ready? I'm not sure. <laughs> Take a look. <laughs> we have something to tell you. We can't keep it a secret any longer. See, from the very beginning, I knew he was a winner. I felt the same way. So now it's time for everybody in the world to know. Burger King has switched to Pepsi. Together at last. Together at last. <laughs> That is incredible. Burger mm. King, 1983. Yeah, Why that was. Why don't they make commercials like that anymore? That was Elizabeth Shue. Yeah, um, yeah that was uh, all my 
life is on YouTube. Yeah, it's all there to be found. <laughs> it, all <came> back. <laughs> it all came back. Thank goodness it did because there's so much fun to be seen. Thank you so much for joining us again. Oh, thank you. So it's been fun to spend the afternoon with you. You guys, he has a book event tonight. You can go meet him yourself at Palace City of Books in downtown Portland. The event starts at 7 p.m. The book, again, is Walking with Sam. It is so good to read, and we'll have more information about it on our website at katu.com. Don't go away. We'll be right back with more Afternoon Live right after this.